Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Plaksha, a very warm welcome to all of you to this open house on biological systems engineering at Plaksha. It's a major that I'm personally extremely excited about, and all of us here on the panel are very, very excited to talk more about it with you and the kind of opportunities that it can open up for you. My name is Palavi. I'm part of the strategy and programs team at Plaksha, and I'm going to help moderate this session. I'm pleased to introduce our four distinguished panelists here today. First, we have Professor Rudra Pratap. Uh, Professor Pratap is going to be the founding vice chancellor at Plaksha, as many of you may have seen or read on our website. Uh, he was previously the deputy director at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and also the founding chairperson and professor for the Center for Nanoscience and Engineering at ISC. He is known as a pioneer in the field of micro and nano electromechanical systems, uh, short forms are MEMS and NEMS. Uh, he's a PhD from Cornell University and a BTEC from IIT Kharagpur. Thank you, Professor Pratap, for being here. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Rucha Joshi, who is going to be joining us as a founding faculty at Plaksha. She has been an assistant professor of teaching in biomedical engineering at UC Davis and has a PhD in biomedical engineering from Purdue. Her research interest is interestingly in engineering education and instructional innovation. So she's working on a diverse set of projects that are around enhancing teaching, learning, outreach, diversity of engineers, and much more. Third, we have Dr. Ravi Jasuja, uh, who is a founder at Plaksha, has been involved in it right from its early days of conceptualization. He is the Director of Translational Research and Discovery at Brigham and Women's Hospital at Howard Medical School. He got his BTEC from IIT Delhi and PhD from University of Hawaii. In addition to being an incredible researcher and a very passionate educator, he's also an entrepreneur and he's running his own company in the biospace. Uh, he also comes in every year uh, to take classes at the Young Tech Scholars Program, which is a high school summer program that Laksha has been running for the last several years. Lastly, we have with us Dr. Ritesh Malik, who was also a founder at Plaksha and been involved right from its early stages. His degree is actually as a medical doctor, but he chose to be an entrepreneur at a very early age of 23. Uh, he's founded several companies, one of which is Innovate. That's a co-working space many of you would have heard of. He was listed in Forbes 30 under 30, 40 under 40, got funding from Y Combinator, and is currently an investor in a lot of startups. He's also the director of Radix Healthcare, which is a hospital in Delhi and has been at the front line of treating COVID-19 patients and vaccinations um, ever since the pandemic started. Um, he also mentors a lot of startup teams at Plaksha. We're really glad to have all of you here on the panel. Thank you so much for uh, everybody who made it to the session. Uh, we want this session to be very interactive. So while I'm going to start off by asking some questions to the panelists, please feel free to keep putting in questions anytime in the Q&A box, and we can also take them along the way. We'll have a dedicated Q&A section at the end, but we can also keep take it along, um, along with the discussion. Okay, um, so getting started, the first question, this is uh, for you, Ravi. Going back to the history of how this major was created, uh, the name of this major, as you'd remember, it took several months and a lot of time to come up with the name and the choice of biological systems, engineering, those three words, there was a lot of thought that went behind it. Uh, so we'd love for you to just spend a couple of minutes to talk through why this name was chosen. Uh, thanks, Pallavi. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, you know, as you will realize uh, through our conversations uh, and interactions with RP, Ritesh, Rucha, Pallavi, and the team at Plaksha, that this is truly a very intentional way of um, articulating the thematic focus. You know, nothing about Plaksha is circumstantial. Nothing is circumstantial. Everything uh, has um, spawned from a huge amount of uh, passionate discussions and conversations. 
And that is reflective of even this title. And you will see that across even title of every uh, course um, because the title, it is almost like the um, conversation centerpiece because it establishes an expectation. It establishes an expectation from the uh, faculty as well as from the student because a student should know that at the end of it, what kind of um, uh, understanding of these interdisciplinary aspects uh, I would have and what I expect my mentors to educate me. And so now let me break this down for you slightly. And, you know, as Pallavi mentioned, we went through numerous, numerous combinations of uh, ideas as well as reviewing and the uh, leading programs across the world. And what we realized was that we should expose our students to inherent complexity in this translational sciences. You know, because we would be educating the fellows to think about biologically inspired problems, that means everything else has to become tool. Uh, and if it is a tool, then the kids cannot be limited in how we educate them. So that is why you would see um, it gives us an opportunity having a, an expressive uh, title like a systems engineering, not uh, per se biological in engineering or bioengineering allows us to integrate uh, expertise of faculty from electrical engineering from, you know, RP will come and give a lecture. Ritesh will come and give a lecture on how to think about translating your ideas for human health. Rucha would come and may question kids around their ethics of these um, uh, courses or how they internalize the education. Pallavi or Neeraj and all these experts from the industry would come in to actually allow our kids to foster a interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary kind of curriculum. So that was the idea at the intersection. So I'll stop here and RP, Ritesh, Ruchal can join in because this is very important, very important how you set the tone of our education, RP. Good evening. Uh, th thank you, Ravi. Welcome everybody. Uh, Ravi has already uh, said uh, quite, Quite nicely, he has, he has told you what uh, this name means and why we chose this name. But uh, you know, in in academics, for last two decades, the kind of uh, progress that biology has made is incredible. You know, it's it's uh, no 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 time period, no comparable time period in history. You can find uh, you know the kind of progress we have made. And the reason is because technology has gotten into biology big time. This is the this is the intersection where so much is happening today. All of you are aware. All of you must have read in the newspapers that this is the first time we have come up with a vaccine so fast. You know, within within one year of having a pandemic, a vaccine. How did that come about? If it wasn't for technology there wouldn't have been this vaccine done so quickly. And all the advances that we are making in, in, in the frontiers of medicine today, or even in our understanding of human health, there is so much of computing, AI, machine learning, all of that is being used. So we want to prepare now, we want to uh, have engineers of a completely different kind of upbringing, academic upbringing I'm talking about. You know, so we want to impart education which prepares you for coming decades, okay? And not be stuck with the, with the kind of courses that we had in the past. So that's the idea. And that's why this combination is so important, uh, you know, for anybody, uh, you know, going forward in these areas. This is the combination that is going to propel society, propel you to come up with absolutely new innovations that drive uh, society today. RP, let me add just one sentence. You just uh, ticked me slightly. I think, and your statement, the first opening statement is very powerful. I think 
every fellow who comes to our program should ask this question and have the answer why bother why bother to do it you know i think this will be our mission that why bother to even study this and then you have changed what we can teach you so i'll stop here rp thank you great great great, great addition ravi that was good thank you so much uh, professor pratap and uh, professor jasuja for those answers um maybe if you could also talk a little bit about the kind of you already spoke a bit about the kind of impact uh, this program can have on human health uh, if you can also talk about its the broader impact it can have on both human and planetary health i think all the discussions uh, you know during this pandemic have been pointing out so much on what is going on around us in the environment itself okay and how that is impacting health of people it's not that it happened only during pandemic it's just that during pandemic people have more time to pay attention to such things and then uh, you know people are paying attention and listening to it but it's very clear that environmental factors affect our health and human beings uh you know affect the planet's health so much you know it is it is a two way street uh you know this this whole era is called anthropocene era you know because the the human beings are for the first time ever in the history of or in the life of the planet human beings are affecting the life of the planet so this is so important to understand how this coupling works the two way coupling and that's why we are we are setting up this uh, institute of human health and planetary health together so that we can explore this uh, this coupling we can explore this interdependence of the two things i i think that uh, you know uh, all kids today are very very aware because information is readily available very aware of what's going on in our environment how it is impacting us and what is the forecast going a, a decade later what does it look like you know there are red flags all over the place it's time to act now so unless we we know what to do how are we going to be able to affect these changes and that's what this uh, this this institute is all about we are looking at you know the 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 grandest challenges of the next 100 years that's what we are looking at when you look at this subject and that's what it is about so this is at the core of uh, you know praksha's mission yeah i think rp you you captured it quite well and this this bidirectionality <coughs> cannot be over emphasized you know i think it is just at and recognition of this bidirectionality into the core curriculum is really a transformative thinking you know it is we have not made it into an a peripheral aspect that how oh, you take one course in sustainability no we have actually uh, intentionally incorporated modules where the cues for even a fundamental course uh, would actually the fellows would have to take cues from biologically inspired ideas and could be you know could be whether it is you then start thinking about that if you need to develop next generation of drugs can you generate models of expression using engineering biology you know could you so suddenly you have taken a different approach to to decade long dogmas and practices so i'll stop here but i think we'll come back to this idea repeatedly because this is this is the core of our our intent so i you know ritesh or prucha please uh, add thank you um so that's very very helpful in terms of laying out the kind of grand challenges that students of this nature would be able to work on and all the panelists that we have here today their own journeys are intertwined uh, with that in some way or the other so we'd love for all of you to speak about your individual journeys uh, in this context and maybe talk about a couple of experiences or projects uh, that you've been involved with related to this so starting first with ritesh uh, you've had a really really exciting journey and for any student uh, they can ask you about being a doctor as well as being an entrepreneur or running a, like anything um so if you can talk 
a little bit about your journey and where you are right now and how you see the context of this major in that. Thank you very much, Pallavi. First of all, thank you very much, Professor Pratap and uh, Dr. Ravi for, for those uh, lovely introductions about the, the entire thesis of why we are building this. When it comes to my journey, I, I, I'm a medical doctor and, and while pursuing my medicine, I realized that in a country like India, where we have under 2% national GDP going to healthcare, we cannot provide healthcare for all. After all, we are 137 crore Aadhaar card holders in India. How do we, and, and healthcare should be the first fundamental right of any citizen of a, of, a, of a country. Before the right to freedom, before the six civic rights in our society, the first right should be the right to health. And as WHO defines health, health is, is basically a complete, <clears throat> a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just an absence of a disease or infirmity. So the whole idea is how can we ensure that 5 lakh children who die just because of dysentery in India every year do not die? How do we ensure that, 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 that millions of people every year who get infected by tuberculosis do not or lose whose uh, morbidity led years. So the whole idea, I, I'm, I'm madly passionate about the idea of intertwining disciplinary studies of biology and engineering. Being a doctor, you can prescribe a paracetamol, you can do a lot of things, but you have an upper limit. You can see 100 to 150 patients a day. Being an entrepreneur, being, being a system, systems engineer or being a, a design thinker, you can build products and can change the system and then ensure that 137 crore people can be healthy. One such project for me was the first one that we started was, uh, we, we called it OTAR. This was a very interesting project, Operation Theater Augmented Reality Platform. In India, we saw a massive gap in the skill of doctors who used to perform surgeries in villages and the skill of doctors who used to perform surgeries in cities. So we thought, can we aid, can we aid leveraging augmented reality, the gap between the skills of these surgeons by transmitting live surgeries on, on, on a large projector screens. Of course, in 2012, that massively failed. But the whole idea and, and, and one of the key reasons why, why, why we are building Plaksha is we don't know whether we'll be able to build something great or not. But our, our responsibility for our students is to enable them to ask the right questions. It's not about whether the Wright brothers could fly or not. The right question was that, can we fly? And, and I think that is something with biology and engineering. In the coming decades, this is going to be the most, uh, one of the most key priorities for nations for private companies and for human race. After all, elongation of human race is all that humans care for. And I think that is something which can only happen at scale if we have a bio and engineering club together. Thanks a lot, Ritesh. Um, moving on to Rucha. Uh, Rucha, if you want to spend a couple of minutes and walk through your journey as well. You got interested in this at a pretty young age similar to most people in the audience today. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Pallavi, and welcome everyone again, and good evening. Um, so I uh, would like to just uh, uh, take you through this short story. I, in my high school 12th grade, uh, was working on a National Children's Science Congress project. Uh, the theme was food systems in India. And I grew up in a small town, uh, Nanded, uh, in Maharashtra and uh, I, we formed a group and we looked around, okay, what can we do to uh, contribute towards this theme to, to the betterment of food systems, right? And we noticed there were, Nanded being one of the major banana production centers, there's a lot of wastage of 
uh, bananas and therefore of their peels. And, uh, you know, we did a little bit of research and found out um, actually the peels are edible. They have a good source of fiber, uh, minerals, vitamins, and are, you know, and uh, my grandmother used to make a curry out of it. And we thought, okay, we are, we are, uh, wasting this incredible product so can we use it in an edible product right and so i went ahead and formed cookies out of this banana peel pulp uh, of course there were failures uh the first time we made it you know the biscuit was so soggy that it fell down you know and um so but that whole journey of um you know starting from this recipe of creating banana pill cookies to achieving a patent um patent out of it uh, through CSIR and uh, it got me an opportunity to represent India at the time in Japan and um, be a part of this wonderful 10 students team um who had this these kinds of incredible innovations and as a result when we returned back we were offered an opportunity to meet our ex-president late uh, honorable apj kalam um, and the whole journey was so inspiring for me uh, that i thought um, you know if when we went on this international platform, there were eight-year-olds uh, who won World Intellectual Property Organizations awards for their innovations on, you know, whatever the simple idea uh, they had. Uh, students in Japan, let's say they were making uh, robots at that time uh, in their high school, eight, you know, 10 years old. And all of that was, you know, eye-opening to see that we, we need to up our game in uh, not just compete in this theory-based, textbook-based um, uh, learning, but do the real innovation in the life uh, and, uh, you know, be on this world stage to contribute to the human and planetary health topics. Um, so I, I went ahead and wrote a book on this uh, journey and it won a literature prize in uh, Maharashtra. But uh, I, I thought of all this, you know, as uh, the nourishing environment that I got through my parents, my uh, exposure to these innovative projects. You know, if we could give the this sort of environment to um, students at Plaksha, imagine the number of innovations, uh, number of um, out of box ideas and number of courageous uh, volunteers to contribute to this human and planetary health um, and grand challenges themes we can get. So um, that's my overall inspiration. I uh, also worked in biomedical engineering uh, for my PhD on a tissue engineering project. Uh, hopefully that's exciting for you. I the, One of the major challenges there is scaling up tissues in three dimension, right? We, people can make 2D, um, let's say, scaffolds or you know let's say take an example of skin if you want to make it two-dimensional uh, uh creation in a, a pitter dish let's say it's easier but building it in three dimension on a large scale is a big challenge especially because the blood vessels the vascularization that those tissues need um that's difficult to build um, so, so I worked on creating a collagen-based uh, scaffold, uh, extracellular matrix to support those blood vascularization. And um, that's one of the interesting projects, similar projects we, you could do at a Plaksha as well. So thank you. I'll stop there. Thanks a lot, Richa. So picking up from what you just said, you laid out what you did as a student and we heard about the big vision for what um, kind of problems in the world this major can solve. Uh, so if we can, and there have been a lot of questions coming in about the curriculum. Uh, if you could help introduce uh, how students would bridge this gap from what they can do as an undergraduate student and eventually move to solving the kind of problems that we spoke about. Um, so if we can just move over to talk a little bit about uh, the curriculum itself. Um, RP, uh, Professor Vitaap, if you want to start with talking about the first three semesters, um, the fresh mode first. Um, and for people who ask this question, you only have to select the major after the third semester, um, not before. So we'll just walk you through this and then we'll get to the specific coursework under the major. Over to you, Professor Vitaap. Sure. Thank you, Pallavi. 
So this is uh, the first three semesters of curriculum, which we call freshmore, as uh, freshman and uh, sophomore combined together. <clears throat> and this is common to all four majors that we are offering, and this will be common to all majors that we'll offer uh, perhaps in the future as well. Uh, so what you can see here, I mean, this this uh, this curriculum has come after so much of churning. It's like uh, you know that that story of Samudra Manthan that you must have heard, you know, uh, in Indian mythology. And after doing Samudra Manthan, something wonderful comes out. So that's what this has been. So the first semester, I know I'll get to ILDC at the end, but let me. Just uh, you know, run through these courses. We have courses from, uh, you know, mathematics stream because math is at the base of lots of things that uh, engineers do. Um, so this gray box that you see, light gray, is a math uh, curriculum, engineering math in action. So this is uh, algebra and ordinary differential equations. But when it when we say math in action, that means it's not about just, you know, chalkboard uh, writing and proving theorems and stuff like that. It's about seeing where everything that we teach you here, where do you use it in engineering and how do you use it? How do you, you know, you might be able to solve three equations by hand, but what if I give you 30,000 or 3 million equations? How do you solve that? You know? Now, the computer algorithms are designed such that it's the same for you know, whether you solve three or three million, you can solve them. So you will you will see from the very first lecture, you will also be in, uh, in computer labs solving uh, these equations. Math of uncertainty is about probability and statistics, modeling with vectors and transforms. You know, this is where you also learn about partial differential equations. You learn about Fourier transforms, Weblet transforms, all kinds of transforms uh, that are used in uh, engineering, Laplace transforms. This is, uh, this is uh, from computer science, uh, you know, uh, major or area. Uh, th so that's one of our foundations is computer science that we talked about. So all of you will learn these courses. Fundamentals of computational thinking, where you learn about logic, you learn about discrete math, you learn about programming, uh, and you do program in Python here in this course, object-oriented programming and data structures. This is an advanced course where for the first time you'll see what, what uh, object-oriented programming means and what kind of language supports that. So you will learn Java here. Um, data science and artificial intelligence. So this is, everybody will, will every single student will learn this. You know, what, what is uh, this whole buzz about data science all about? And what is AI all about? You know, how do you do AI? Well, how do you write AI algorithms? How do you use them? Then we have this uh, uh, engineering core, engineering core, foundations of physical world. This is where you learn all or re-emphasis or re-emphasized physical laws on which engineering design is done, right? So rather than having you know, three semesters of physics, chemistry, and math, look at what how it is structured. So the, the required laws that you must know, you will learn here. Then we go to nature's machines. Nature's machines, whether it's uh, human beings or animals or insects, you learn about how nature designs these, uh, uh, you know, uh, these systems. These are all systems, biological systems, right? These are all biological systems. So how has nature designed it? And this course is my favorite course because, you know, I work in uh, micro and nano, nanoscale sensors. And if you want to see millions of them working together, you know, um, IoT, which, which is inside your body, Internet of Things, you work for Internet of Things inside. How the sensors and actuators work together, how the communication happens, all of that uh, you get to learn here. And then we introduce you to intelligent machines that human beings make. So what are intelligent machines about? What is intelligence for machines? How do you impart intelligence? How do you do sensing, actuation, uh, with some built-in processing all together? That's what intelligent machines are about. But if you're designing things, then you must know 
must have some facility with design. What is design thinking? How do you do design? Right? It's it, design is not a, a, a trivial art. It's it's a very advanced art today, and we must understand how we do design, right? So this is where you will learn, and we'll have plenty of fun here because uh, you know you can design with. Uh, with cardboards, you can design with styrofoam, you can design with wood, metal, 3D printers, and all of that will be in this, um, you know, part of ILGC lab, Innovation Lab and Grand Challenges Studio, where, where you can have tons of fun uh, learning this. And then there is microeconomics. You live in society, how does money work? How does economics work? And uh, as you know, technology is driving today, economies, you know, companies are being compared with countries you know, it, it, that's the kind of economic power they have today. So it's essential that every engineering student, every student understands this uh, and foundations of optimization. Now, all of these are these kinds of, uh, you know, engineering technology core courses, but we live in society and we must understand how society functions. We must understand ourselves too. So this is coming from self and leadership uh, curriculum that we have, critical thinking and scientific reasoning. You know, the, the first box that you see, critical thinking and scientific reasoning. Then you have reimagining technology and society. How is society, uh, you know, propelling technology or demanding technology? And how is technology affecting society? Right in front of our eyes, we have seen, you know, how the whole generation has changed, your generation had changed so dramatically, you know, because of social media and uh, related technologies. Ethics of technological innovation, you know, just because we have this powerful tool, tool called, called uh, technology, should we be able to do anything? Should we, uh, should uh, society not question us? All those questions come here, right? And we got to be compassionate human beings first before we become anything else, engineers or scientists or whatever, right? So we learned that. And this Innovation Lab and Grand Challenges Studio will be open 24 bar seven. Um, Rucha, uh, whom you just heard, she's in charge. She's going to be, uh, uh, you know, helping you with lots of things here. You will understand what are social or grand challenges of our society, of our uh, nation, of this planet, and how do you address these challenges? How do problems scale? You know, the entire campus is going to be a living lab. You will first, first start uh, doing these things at the campus level, then perhaps at the city level, then at state level, then uh, at, uh, at uh, the whole uh, international, national level, you will learn how these problems scale, how the solutions scale. So this is what just the fresh more, more curriculum will give you so much that you know, just based on these three semesters, you can you can turn some things by yourself. Um, so, Pratap, if I can ask you to um, just elaborate a little bit on nature's machines, and you yeah. can use the example of uh, you spoke about the research that you have done in this area, and oh. you often described to us, uh, you know, the project okay. about the crickets. Okay, sure, sure. I would, I would love to do that. So, uh, you know, Pallavi has, uh, you know, heard me uh, about this, uh, this research that I did. The most fun I have had doing research was on on crickets, and all I wanted to know was how do crickets sing so loudly? You know, these are tiny creatures, right? You know, this small, and they produce eighty dB sound at 10 centimeters, if you measure it, 80 dB. That's very loud sound. You, As human beings, we in our normal speech, it's about 75 dB at 10 centimeters. You know, the, the, the computer speakers that you use, you know, they will, they will give you about 90 dB at 10 centimeters. So there, but these tiny things, right? How, where does that sound amplification come from? Uh, Pallavi, can you go through the slide, please? Uh, so here is our cricket, right? You can see the cricket, this is a tiny thing. And now I learned about it from one of my colleagues from ecological sciences, uh, a professor uh, who just lives upstairs from me right now. 
She gave a talk in 2010 in mechanical engineering. I was in that department then. And she, for the first time I learned that crickets don't have any vocal cords. They just move their wings. And, uh, you know, this is called stridulation. From that stridulation, they make, make that, uh, that kind of loud sound and that kind of song. And that every uh, cricket species has its own, you know, it's like they have fixed frequency at which they're singing, right? So this, is, this was amazing. And when she told me what ecologists know, what biologists know about it, I got so excited that this is all mechanical. I must create a model with which we can even predict crickets that don't exist, or we can figure out why this uh, particular frequency band is located to a particular cricket. How does that happen? How does nature do this engineering, right, of uh, spectrum allocation? So we started studying this. And next slide, please. So in the wing, there is a tiny part, that triangular part, which is called the harp. That's the, that's the amplifier. That's the loudspeaker. Okay, uh, so there is actuation and the actuation is amplified by that harp. Next slide, please. If you look underneath that, uh, you know, on one boundary of that harp, if you look underneath, this is a scanning electron uh, micrograph of, of uh, what is there, a set of teeth. Look at that, how beautifully arranged these things are and how beautifully crafted are they. Right. If you look at that, you know, my jaws dropped when I saw that look at this beautiful microengineering that nature does. Right. And this set of teeth is struck by a plectrum. OK, a plectrum goes over it and pushes each teeth uh, one at a time. And that produces a train of impulses that moves the heart up and down. OK. And it is done at a frequency which matches with the resonant frequency of the harp. That's how amplification takes place. So once we learned how cricket does this, we, we started thinking and then we said, aha, we figured, we figured this out now. And based on that principle, we made MEMS speakers, micro electromechanical system speakers. Follow me, next slide, please. And that's, th these, are, these are the speakers. These are tiny, these are just one millimeter. Okay, one millimeter in diameter, each one. And how thick are they? They are just about 10 micrometer thick. That's all there is, 10 micrometer thick, okay? And they make, they make sound, they make beautiful sound. We can, we can, you know, so we are developing this technology further. You know, someday you will be able to see a, a, a calendar in your house, which is speaker, right? It's just, just a picture frame but it's a speaker and it can, uh, it can uh, sing to you. So this, this is the kind of work, you know, I have also done uh, work in other areas, but I have been very interested in how insects, how insects fly and how do they know that they're rotating? How do they do that kind of navigation that is done with gyroscopes? But the nature's gyro is so elegant, so beautiful, as a matter of fact, we, we studied one of the insects, uh, gyros, uh, soldier fly uh, gyros, you know, which are called hot ears. And when we understood how it works, that day I almost felt like giving up engineering. I said, there is no chance that we can compete with nature. You know, so elegant an engineering it has, so elegant a design it has. Unbelievable, right? So because I work in these areas, nature's, world or nature's design, right? Nature's machines are the places to look for these designs, how they scale, what is the scaling law they, they use, what is the design template that nature uses, all of those ideas. And that's what is part of that nature's machines course that you learn. Thank you so much, Professor Pratap. Uh, so what he described right now is the first course that you would have as an introduction to this major. Uh, and now we'd love to talk about the courses that you would take after that, after Freshmore, through semesters, uh, four to eight. Um, well, we, let, me just add, yeah. let me just add one thing. I think um, what is really important that Rudra is, RP is emphasizing is that every course is contextual what you would actually get is a sense of purposes in, in every course. And we all struggled really hard 
to name these courses. And I think that passion came out when RP was describing, even choosing the name of nature's machines. It is the same way. Another intent that we wish to communicate is you will not find courses like introductory physics or introductory biology, because that is not our inter intention. Our intention is not to introduce you to fundamentals, but prompt you to participate in learning with us. So we would rather teach you the fundamentals and then impose much higher expectation from you to come back and discuss with us. So I'll stop here, but you will see this, this theme of how we have internalized your or your kids' education. So. Great. Uh, so, Rucha and Ravi, if, uh, if you could talk a bit about the kind of courses that students would be taking um, over semesters, four and eight in this major, that would be great. Sure. Thank you, Ravi. So, uh, I think uh, just looking at the slide, you know, there might be some names that resonate with your interests. Uh, better with uh, as, as you have read so far, but uh, each of these courses will introduce not only the skills necessary, but also the mindsets. I wanted to add that also in context of the conversation we just had. Um, so let's say engineering one planet, for example, you know, that is going to deal with both environmental and human health. So how does one um, contribute to the grand challenges around human and planetary health uh, with the skill sets and mindsets um, that we are building at Plaksha. Uh, and so ILGC, for example, will complement uh, this course uh, particularly. Um, there's a lot of scope for doing projects in also um, other courses such as genetic engineering, you know, so you, you'll have a wet lab experience, um, you can, you know, so you'll be introduced to CRISPR technology, um, so a lot of up-to-date uh, and knowledge that will be brought from journal papers and uh, talks uh, from world-renowned stalwarts uh, who are leading these technologies will be integrated into that course. Um, there is also, uh, for example, the personalized biomedicine. So the idea of not one size fits all, but how does how can we tailor uh, biomedicine to individual needs of uh, patients? You know, everyone has maybe, for example, the dosage can be different. The uh, delivery of or or the design of the medicine can be different according to let's say genetic makeup of the person or um, uh, overall the system needs for that patient, right? So how does one design, how does one tune uh, for those uh, personalizations, right? So all of that will be a part there. And uh, Ravi, if you want to take over for the rest of the courses. I think what you will see, um, the interdisciplinary nature and the points that RP, um, Rucha, Ritesh, from his life experiences, have brought together is our perspective of how we can prepare the next generation of innovators. And, you know, emotional maturity, uh, worry about each other is extremely important to us. And this is when RP says uh, to be good human beings is not lip service. We, we worry about it. And that is what is very important to us. Um, you know, we can always find enough uh, successful people and their success may be defined by metric of money, uh, metric of, so everybody will define their own metric of success. But if we can generate the next generation of, of critical thinkers who are good human beings, I think we may have served a large purpose of our, our curriculum. Uh, and this comes back here uh, when we even design the courses of biosensing and human interface and what RP was saying. That whole concept of these, we, these courses are not going to be disconnected from their experiences. It's very important to us. And that is why our courses have contextual name because again, the title of the course gives the leeway for the faculty to chaperone the kids in that way of thinking. Uh, it actually imposes, you do not, or may not be able to appreciate, it imposes a great burden 
on the faculty, a great burden on faculty to truly think out of the box in preparing for lectures. These are non-trivial things and we all will be, you know, uh, actually personally, RPI, we all Rucha, will be actually teaching the kids because our own experiences in our intellectual pursuits and academic aspects have allowed us to think in multidisciplinary manner. So now, I mean, translational bioinformatics by itself tells you that, you know, Ritesh could be brought in uh, because he worried about these problems and how he solved these bench to bedside type of issues from his own experiences. So it gives, if I was teaching this course, I would call upon Ritesh, say, Ritesh, come, come here. You know, I want a clinician's perspective. So a person who's thinking about designing a prosthesis worries about soft tissue insult rather than making just a beautiful, beautiful machine. Suddenly a different perspective. You don't want a callus at the interface. And suddenly now the biomaterial perspective comes in or RP comes in to talk about the oath. Uh, you know, evolution word came to my mind. I was teaching just last week these uh, uh, high school kids in our YTS program. And one of the kids said that, you know, we were having lunch. So we have lunch meetings. I was making breakfast and they were listening to me. And uh, they were, they had decided what the menu of my breakfast would be. So I was, they told me to make pancakes. So I made pancakes. Then uh, they wanted me to have scrambled eggs as well as sunny side up. So I was cooking. And one of the fellows actually asked me about extinct species. And, you know, I posed a question back to him. I said that, how do you reconcile? So Darwin said that there is uh, natural selection of the fittest, survival of the fittest. So that means it will take 500 million years to, for a species to evolve. And then Mendel said, oh, within one generation, you can have a mutation and my hair can become orange and my skin can become black. And I don't need to be in sun for 2 million years to turn the whole African nation to be black. So how do you reconcile the two, two ideas, right? So this is the type of, education we are hoping to disseminate to all of you. So I would not go into each of these courses, Pallavi. I think it is important for uh, students to realize that they would be really taught by passionate faculty who worries about, uh, but then, you know, the responsibility increases on the kid. Uh, because if, uh, if RP, I, Rucha, Ritesh, Pallavi, we are giving you one hour of our life, and I give this example every time, if we are giving you one hour of our life to teach you, you better be sincere in absorbing that because we have lost that one hour away from our family. So I think it is a mutual relationship we hope to develop. This will be our family of kids, uh, which we hope to mentor through their lifespan. So I'll stop here. I don't need to, I think sure, sure, absolutely. we not go to details here. Yeah. But so just a couple of questions. Be very clear. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So just a couple of questions that have come up related to coursework. Uh, there's a question from Lakshmi that uh, most traditional engineering programs in India have theory courses that are separate from lab or practical courses. And will that be the case at Plaksha as well in that? Will they be separate? Uh, and then there are some questions. Not. Yeah. Absolutely <laughs> not. You know, that's, that's, these are the molds that break, you know, uh, that has no meaning that the, this is theory course and that is practical course and in practical, you are told what to do. Here we are inviting you to explore. You learn certain things in the, in the, uh, in the lecture and let's go, let's try it out. You know, most of your practical practicals are going to be so-called practicals are going to be open-ended. You are supposed to discover things. You are supposed to, uh, you know, find by yourself what you should measure. What is what is the relevant quantity to measure? If you are measuring something, why are you measuring it? Who cares about that that measurement, right? Where does it fit in the scheme of things? So, our courses are designed such in such a way that for every course, for every single course we have, you can do practicals the so-called practicals, you can try out in ILGC. That's what ILGC is meant for, okay? You can, you can try your hands out. We have, we have specific labs too. There, is, there will be a lab for natural uh, nature's machines, you know, which will be 
biology, kind of biology lab, but it won't be your traditional biology lab, okay, where you are dissecting things, far from it, right? So uh, similarly, physical world, there will be a, a lab, but again, it won't be that you are given, oh, measure this, 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 do these steps and write the report. No. We're going to tell you this is the constant, you know, uh, that there is harmonic motion of objects uh, where the, wherever there is elasticity and wherever there is, uh, you know, some way of storing energy and exchanging. Now there will be things. You build a model. You show you show some kind of oscillatory system, okay, which, which demonstrates that concept. That's the kind of uh, practical that we are thinking of or designing. Meanwhile, while you guys were talking, uh, uh, all three of you, me and Pallavi, were thinking, why didn't we have such amazing professors in our universities? This is this is fantastic, especially the cricket story. Thank you very much, Professor Pratap. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So there are many questions also coming in on career pathways after um, this major. Um, and questions on the side of industry, entrepreneurship, research, all of them, what are the opportunities in all of these. So Ritesh, if you could come in at this point and maybe uh, just talk first a little bit about, um, you already spoke about how um, you know the future is going to be reinvented by the intersection of bio and tech. If you want to add on that a little bit and use that to explain uh, what impact that will have on jobs in industry as well as entrepreneurial opportunities. See, Pallavi, coming from uh, the angle of economics, I truly believe bio, biology and, and technology are going to completely revolutionize the implementation of Industry 4.0, be it 3D printing, be it artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, and, and also, this is a relatively nascent time where a lot of people currently are talking about coding, about, about computer sciences. The future, if, if we want to prepare students of, of the future, we need them to focus on industries which are going to explode exponentially in the coming two to, two, two, two to maximum three decades. In my opinion, uh, globally, and not only in India, globally, we are going to see massive grants coming in for research, massive opportunities in entrepreneurship. And because there will be massive uh, opportunities in entrepreneurship, there these entrepreneurs will be creating a lot of jobs. And these jobs will translate, and, and, and there'll be a massive supply-demand gap where the, the jobs will be more than the number of students because us, uh, in, in, in being very candid, a lot of people don't truly understand bioengineering. And this is not because of students, but because of the way educational institutes are imparting that knowledge. Uh, so, so and, and if you see for industry 4.0, the single point theta is data. Now, the question is, which object has the largest amount of data in the world? There's nothing more, there's no more data in this world than this human body. One cell has 1.5 GB of data. Now, when you multiply this by 100 trillion cells in our body, we have 150 trillion GB data. That's, that's close to 37.5 uh, billion iPads of 32 uh, GB storage. So, so if you see, and this is just one human body, uh, in my opinion, uh, Industry 4.0 is will be will be significantly stunted without implementation on biology. Things like 3D printing, giving you very basic examples. And 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 as an entrepreneur, as an angel investor, I have invested in a lot of of biology linked technology companies. Uh, and, and we are seeing an explosion of these companies. People have started recognizing the opportunity because human beings, especially post-pandemic, the value of implementation of modules which can elongate human race, which can alleviate morbidity and mortality both. So WHO came with a very interesting term. They said, why do we question or judge a country's economic slash social condition by life expectancy. We should, we should judge a, a country's 
is overall socioeconomic health by number of years lost. Now, that means that if the life expectancy in India is, say, 70 years, and I die because of, of the pandemic or because of the coronavirus disease at 31, that means that 70 years minus 31 years was the life if, or, that, that I could have lived easily. Now, adding all of that it will give you the true mortality and morbidity in our country. Uh, and this is very interesting, uh, uh, Pallavi. The largest cause of personal bankruptcy in the Indian subcontinent is healthcare. And, and, and while we all sit in our cushioned homes, there are millions of people just waiting to die because there is the, the healthcare is not affordable. We do not have insurance. We do not have, have hospitals and a country. And if you compare the GDPs between India and the United States, we are talking about a massive gap, a gap of 17.75% from 19.75 to almost under 1.75% GDP. So the whole idea, and, and, and after talking to a lot of folks within the government, we, we, we are seeing that a lot of push will be given towards bioengineering and, and, and healthcare needs to be solved, not by increasing the number of beds, because we will not be able to do that. We need to increase the number of preventive touch points that we can. We need to increase the infrastructure of testing. We need to increase the infrastructure of personal diagnostics. We need to increase the infrastructure of mammography. Now, you'll be amazed if a lump in the breast is found at an early stage, the chances of survival are as high as 91%. The challenge is, one, we don't know. We don't have healthcare information. Two, we do not go to the doctor at the right time. And three, we do not have enough number of super speciality beds. So the whole idea, in my opinion, is that we would need to rethink our economy's healthcare priorities. And this will not be by increasing the number of beds, but by increasing in, and incentivizing researchers partner with entrepreneurs. And together, they will develop job opportunities. And this will be, like in my opinion, two areas, as you rightly mentioned, the planetary health and human health. These two areas, we, we, we will see trillions of, 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 of rupees, not dollars, trillions of rupees going down on, uh, on these two sectors. We have, we've seen the story of Tesla, uh, in my opinion, space exploration, in my opinion. Uh, so for example, uh, just taking in, in you through a couple of uh, uh, technologies that are working very well in the bioengineering space and have started monetizing. And all of them are 100 plus million companies. A lot of, of the founders are my friends from Y Combinator. Our example, 3D printing. Now, 3D printing, in, so, so just imagine, do you know how many people die in India just because they do not get the right transplant at the right time? And India is one of the largest black markets for a liver transplant. Now, now these kind of things happen because there are the, the, the ethical committees, it, it takes a lot of time. 3D printing can help you create artificial tissues which work better than human, hum, human tissues. Uh, things like artificial intelligence. We are the largest country which, which creates the largest number of X-rays in the world. Now, we are a country which are, which is, and, and this is obviously excluding China because we do not know the numbers, but we on an average do roughly seven to eight lakh X-rays every day. Now, using this data, we can come out with, uh, with, with amazing technologies where because our doctor to population ratio is so screwed that we can actually have people who are, are bioengineers tell you whether you have a tuberculosis or a coronavirus or not. Things like nanotechnology. Why are we, after cancer, the biggest challenge is the side effects of the cancer medicines or the chemotherapy precision medicine, things which are completely nano-focused. I, I think these are the things that have huge, huge potential. Uh, things like, uh, so this is very interesting. I invested in a company called Asimov Robotics, and they've just signed a large contract with Narayana Healthcare in Bangalore. 
where they are developing autonomous vehicles to 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 decrease the number the load on nurses for transferring basic medicines and 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 blood samples now now within the hospital now there are so many companies doing amazing work and all of them are doing extremely well i have a very dear friend of mine who's working on elongation of life of their pets the whole idea and 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 you see the global global narrative now is improve the well-being of humans improve the well-being of our planet and if you see globally there are there's a lot of capital infusion both by the government and private organizations and if you see fda which used to take approximately 7 to 8 years to 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 actually give clearance for or multiple trials for a particular drug has just started something called the breakthrough clearance forum where the fda says we will give you clearance within 12 to 16 months if your technology can literally save a lot of lives so the whole idea is we need to build entrepreneurs we need to build entrepreneurship around bioengineering and ensure that we are able to build and, and india needs to be the me- the the mecca the hub for this for the world great thanks so much ritesh and you know you have mentored so many uh, students working on startups who are currently part of the tech leaders fellowship program at plaksha uh, could you maybe spend uh, just a couple of minutes talking about the kind of support that plaksha provides for students who are interested in entrepreneurship and maybe um, share the example of, um, of course. you know a couple of students yeah so i think uh, because plaksha has been found uh, has been has been uh, uh, is an initiative by a lot of technology founders i think as a team our our, our propensity towards entrepreneurship is very high because that's in our dna uh, I, i i i truly believe that we are not here to uh, our, our our sole purpose is to build an inclusive yet sustainable education system where professors like professor rutra dr rucha dr ravi can be accessible to young minds and i think that is only possible when uh, the, the, there's a win win situation for the students as well as for the teachers as dr ravi rightly said when it comes to plaksha for us that ecosystem of empowering empowering brilliant ideas go into execution and convert themselves into large uh, impactful corporations is extremely important and for that at plaksha uh, because our group of of founders trustees uh, the, all the donors are extremely pro entrepreneurship we spend a lot of time with any 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 student who has as an idea we help them garner the entire mentorship process help them come out with uh, and and also when it comes to mentorship one thing which is very important is we help them ensure that they do not make mistakes that we did i did a lot of mistakes in the first 3 years of my entrepreneurial journey so all those things can be imparted and they should not waste time doing the same mistakes over and over again so so, so yesterday while talking to the tlf batch they asked me that uh, what happens post plaksha we we said that post plaksha plaksha is a community it you 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 cannot uh, dissociate it from plaksha it's a community it's a lifelong relationship and it's a group of people who want to change something it's a group of people who ask questions it's a group of people who do not only have a longing for monetary gains but to create technologies to create valuable products that have an impact on the last man standing and that is something that we are very passionate about at plaksha we are extremely proud of our students example lakshya example ramya uh, who have been building a lot of interesting in a uh, product be it in healthcare space be it in retail tech be it in a lot of different in types of uh, industries and for example stim veda is a very interesting uh, internet of things uh, a healthcare device that that these folks are developing and have been doing in extremely well for their age and 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 have been have, have been pitching at various forums example uh, with with the uh, uh, with, with this is this is in the photos in the pictures 
yeah, is, is Tim Draper in the picture, who's one of the most successful uh, Silicon Valley VCs. So the idea is Lakshya is a platform. You can use it, whether you want to go in for entrepreneurship, whether you want to go into research, whether you want to go into uh, uh, getting a, a tire one job, doing something in, in a multi-billion dollar uh, health tech company. The, the, the world is literally your oyster. The whole idea is that and you just need to really work hard and, and, and give your best for the next four years and you'll see you, you'll be at the epitome of what you do. Thanks so much, Ritesh. Ritesh, if you can also elaborate on many, so for the people who are not as keen on entrepreneurship um, or research and they want to go in for industry careers, if you can talk a little bit about how the environment here is changing vis-a-vis, -vis, say, 10 years ago. Oh, yes. Biotech has completely transformed uh, the, the, the venture capital space. So basically how 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 all oh, these large companies, if you see companies like Apple, companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Google, all of them and have their missions that by 2030, a significant amount of their revenues need to come from health tech. If you see uh, when Apple Watch was was introduced, they never they, they they just thought that it'll just be a watch. Today, an Apple Watch can literally do everything for you. It can tell you what your SpO2 levels are, and tomorrow we will see almost ninety percent of all your normal diagnosis will be done by wearable devices. At the same in, in, on 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 the on the same footprint, uh, Amazon, uh, uh, Microsoft, all these companies eventually healthcare. Health Health tech will become a very important part of, 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 of these large technology companies, especially on their revenue side. When it comes to artificial intelligence startups, uh, they are getting they, they're getting flushed with venture capital. And because of that, there are amazing lucrative opportunities. And here I would like to mention, if you do not want to become an entrepreneur uh, and you want to still be a part of that at, at, at culture of entrepreneurship, go into early stage hyper growth companies and get easy shops in these companies and when you do that and, and the good part is in the and you should not think about today you should not think about 2021 you should think about 2025 when you will be out there to get these jobs and the number of jobs will be much much uh, uh, higher than the number of students good students who are doing biotech so so in my opinion and, uh, and, and especially we've seen pharma companies is buying patents right left and center uh, diagnostic will become so so early early on we were seeing that diagnostics was just because as if you had say a fever you would go in for for for, for say getting yourself tested diagnostics generating data of your body will become a routine and because of which diagnostics alone will be a huge industry and because of which these these four specific sectors are are very hot in the next four to five years but in my opinion there are six to seven more industries that are going to open up which we are not on which we don't even know today thank you ritesh uh, we just have a few minutes left so i just wanted to take the last question, uh, which has come from many people around the research environment at Plaksha. Uh, so what opportunities they can engage with while at Plaksha as part of curriculum, as well as um, research opportunities later, including what kind of partnerships we have and so on. Uh, RP, if you'd want to take a shot at that. Of course, we'll be glad to. <laughs> so uh, research is something uh, we, we keep saying that research is going to be in the DNA of Plaksha. Right, which means that everybody will be everybody will be engaged in in research. We are setting up several research centers, and students will have the opportunity from the very first semester to engage in research. You know, there will be opportunity from all faculty members in these research centers. You know, we have exciting programs with industry as well. Uh, because most of the research centers you're setting up are in partnership with industries. So you will have throughout four years, you will have uh, opportunities to participate in research and with uh, faculty members and friends, colleagues like Ravi, you have opportunity even to go abroad and uh, do research summers. We will even try to figure out if you can do it uh, during a regular semester as an exchange student visitor with our partner institutions, right? So we are working on uh, those kinds of arrangements. 
But let me guarantee you one thing. If you are interested in research, you will find every opportunity that you want at Plaksha, whether you want to work at Plaksha or whether you want to work uh, you know, in some other corner of this world with some you know, other researcher, we will make it happen. That's, that's how committed we are about research. Can I just add quickly to that? Uh, also, there will be opportunity to uh, get scholarships like Grand Challenge Scholars Program we have, uh, which will give you a formal experience in not only your faculty's research labs, but also explore relevant projects for of interest, of industry research interest. Um, so, so not only around Plaksha's, within Plaksha's ecosystem, but around it and, and then scale it up gradually as you move through Plaksha's curriculum. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, good night to everybody in India. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to Rucha and Ravi who are joining in from Pacific time and Eastern time respectively. <laughs>